Hello. Yep. So um, I'm Peter Lumsdain. I'm um, also part of the Univalent Foundations group, like several of the other speakers so far. And I want to um, talk today about higher inductive types, which are a kind of fun new scheme of type definitions that we're experimenting with in the theory. But so firstly, what are lower? What are the old inductive types that we already have are well understood? There's one that you're all very familiar with, the natural numbers. Um, and the syntax for defining um, the natural numbers in um, some implementations of the type system would be something like this. And I'll use this syntax as we go through for lots of definitions because it's more convenient than um, any of the alternatives. So one, so one can specify the natural numbers um, by the scheme saying, OK, they're a type. And 0 is an element of the natural numbers. And the, the successor of any natural number is, again, a natural number. OK, well, those are certainly true. And intuitively, we want the idea that the naturals are freely generated by those. And we all know how to make that idea precise the natural numbers in several different ways, induction or recursion, which can be um, kind of summed up informally in prose by an elimination principle, is the type theoretic jargon for it. To give any function defined on the natural numbers, it's enough to say what that function does for 0 and what it does for the successor of any natural number. And in a type theory way, where you're using um, the types to carry your logic, as well as the um, kind of sets we would traditionally think of as sets, this principle also gives you induction. Um, since you think of a proof of some property of all natural numbers as a function which gives for each natural number a proof. And so how do you do induction? You have to say how to prove it for 0, and then how to prove it for a successor. And in the successor case, the fact you have an indu induction hypothesis comes also out of the, um, spe this inductive definition specification. The fact that successor has a recursive call in it means you're allowed to also make a recursive call when you're defining functions out of it. And so inductive definitions is a wide scheme of um, definitions for types, generalizing this in several ways for the standard well-understood inductive types. You can have more constructors. The natural numbers have two. You might have none or zero, none or one or a dozen. Um, you can have more arguments in those constructors. You can have mutually inductive types, and you can make dependent types. But um, what it all adds up to is a very general scheme for giving definitions of types, which in um, a lot of type theories is taken as a basic axiom, a basic way of constructing types. And in fact, it's immensely powerful. Together with function types, it turns out that that gives you a type theory expressive enough to use as a foundation of mathematics. Um, and that's sort of the starting point for a lot of um, what a lot of the type theories that we're looking at um, in the foundations group. The semantics of these sorts of inductive definitions are fairly well understood. Um, one can reasonably say very un well understood, but there are lots more bells and whistles that some people can add. And the more bells and whistles you add, then the shakier some of the semantics get. But certainly for the main core, um, there is a large core of um, a wide family of inductive definitions, which is wide enough to be very powerful and has very well understood semantics. They're also very nicely suited to implementation and computation. And Dan talked about this a bit on Friday. Um, it, um, it's both very practical for writing proof assistance from a theoretical point of view. That's saying that the proof theoretic um, properties of the systems um, therein are very nice indeed. But the particularly interesting and perhaps surprising thing about these, from our point of view, is that they give us these um, identity types, equality types, as they were originally called when they were um, first defined, which were intended for representing equality in the logic. But as has um, recently um, been found and kind of gives the main impetus for what we're doing in the special year, those equality types can actually be seen as path types. And they can carry, um, they can be a lot more non-trivial than one thinks of equality as being. And so that lets one think of the types on the reasoning about not as sets, as they were originally envisaged, but to um, use it as a logic for talking about things that seem to behave like spaces. In particular, they could be homotopically non-trivial. Path types, a quality one thinks of as it's either true or it isn't. Whereas a path type in a space 
path objects could have lots of different paths between the same thing. So this gives us a way to reason about homotopic and non-trivial objects. But we also want, to, if we want to do homotopy, type, homotopy theory in the type theory, we also need ways to construct homotopically non-trivial objects. And so that's what higher dimensional inductive types, so higher inductive types are short, but the higher is short for higher dimensional. That's the um, impetus, the main motivation for defining them. We generalize um, the inductive definitions that are taken as axioms of the type theory to allow constructors giving paths. In most inductive types, in normal inductive types, as in the natural numbers, each constructor ends up giving you a point of the space. So both zero is a point of the space, and successor, it takes in some arguments, an old point of the space, and it gives you a new point in the natural numbers. But, in st but if we generalize this and allow constructors to also give paths, then you can get some interesting new things. So say we want to think of the circle as it's the space, the type, freely generated by, well, we, could, we put in a base point, and then we put in a path from that um, point to itself. And since we, we, we're already able to talk about paths, this is something we can specify, and it's something which, with a bit of thought, we can write down the elimination principle. And again, to formally write that down in the type theory does take a fair bit of thought, but informally, it's very analogous to the sort of thing one has for ordinary inductive types. It says to give a function out of the circle, it's enough to define what it does to the base point and what it does to the loop. It should take the base point to a point of wherever it's going, and it should take the loop to a path from that point to itself in wherever you're going. And so this gives us a candidate for um, a type which we might call the circle. So how can we use it? How can we get a feel and see is it really anything like what we think the circle should behave like? So just looking at, um, so the answer is yes, it does. It does seem to behave nicely like that. Um, but looking at one example of the sort of thing one can do, which gives a kind of taster for um, how one can use this rule. What is a dependent type over the circle? What's, so we think um, of dependent types over a, over a type originally they were thought of as, well, it's a family of sets indexed by some set. It's a map from your base set into the universe of all sets. But if we're thinking of spaces, we want to think of it as a continuous map into the family of spaces. And so mo when one models that, when one gives semantics, gives models in um, standard categories of spaces, one models dependent types as vibrations. And so we tend to think of these two things interchangeably in the theory and the language. But formally in the theory, that's represented by a map from, from the circle to the universe of types. OK, that's a map out of the circle. So our elimination principle says, so it's specified exactly by a type, a point of this, th which is the image of the base point, and then a path from x to itself in type. So a point and then a path from that point to itself. But if we have the univalence axiom, that path from x to itself it's an equality between types. And that's exactly an equivalence between types. So we're looking for a type x and an endo-equivalence of the space itself. So um, in vibration language, that endo-equivalence will um, correspond to the action of transporting around the loop. And if you're familiar with um, vector bundles in the language of clutching functions, this may start to sound, um, start to be ringing a bell. So, for example, if we take what's, um, what's an interesting, what's a kind of comparatively accessible example of a uh, type and a non-trivial equivalence from it to itself, so not just the identity, the integers and the map adding one to an integer, that's an isomorphism, so it's certainly an equivalence. What do you get? Well, if we, um, we have here, we've got the circle. And we're, we're saying we have the base point. So the fiber over the base point is supposed to be, you get a copy of the integers. And we're specifying that the action of transporting any point up here in the fiber around the loop sends x to x plus 1. So that's saying in our vibration, you kind of, you go around once. That's not quite a big enough loop. Um, but you go around once over the original thing, and you get back to the fiber over the base, but now you're one higher than you were before. And similarly, you can go around again 
And each time, each time you go around over the circle, it takes you around to one higher than you were before. And so this, at least hand waverly, it looks like it's defining the helix, the universal cover um, of the circle. And with a bit of work in the type theory, one can take this, play around with it, and yep, it does give you the universal cover of the circle. It gives you a kind of way into arguments like the fundamental group of the circle, um, and so on internally. So this is the sort of way that the elimination principles for higher inductive types give you the kind of things that you want homotopically. So the circle's sort of the simplest example that one can lead off with, but there's quite a lot of different flavors of things you can get out with them. You can make the mapping cylinder of any function. Um, you can say, well, you, take a, um, you have a function x to y, you take a copy of y, you take a copy of x, um, and then we give paths from everything in the copy of x down to its image in the copy of y. And if we set this up and write in the type theory, we can get it so that it's automatically fibered over y. And then that, it gives us something which acts very much like a cofibration trivial fibration factorization. And in particular, it lets us um, construct um, essentially all the main parts of a quill and model structure and so it gives us a lot of building blocks for transferring um, standard homotopical arguments into the type theory. Another thing one can do with a slightly different flavor, one can get pi naught, the connected components of something, which um, one thinks of as, the, uh, one can think of in spaces as a reflection taking any space and putting it into a homotopically discrete space, one that's equivalent to a set. And to do this, we need to end up using something which is actually properly recursive, like the natural numbers were. One of the constructors takes in arguments from the type that we're constructing. But that's OK. The scheme gives a clear eliminator we can write, and it still works nicely. Um, just as a less toy example, this one is uh, Mike Shulman um, pointed it out, a kind of fun, interesting, more elaborate example. One can define spectra and pre-spectra. So, um, Pre-spectra is a certain sequence of pointed spaces with maps between them and each other's loop spaces. When once, uh, so a spectrum is a particularly nice one when these maps are always equivalences. And one can get the spectrification, so the free spect that trim on it, um, free here always meaning homotopically so, um, one can get that directly as a higher inductive type, which I won't put time in full because it uses eight constructors and they're all quite long. Um, but it's very practical. Lots more different examples you can get. You can have lots of fun with these. So kind of summing up, higher inductive definitions extend ordinary inductive definitions, and they give a, ver a very nice unified and precise language for expressing universal properties of spaces. And a lot of these universal properties are ones which are um, kind of quite well known and familiar, and, have, and there's good machinery out there on what to do with them, how to exploit them. But this gives us a good unified language for them, which fits very nicely into the um, way that type theory is set up, and so seems very well suited for um, constructing, um, doing these kind of homotopical constructions within the type theory. What's open about it? What, what do we really hope to do? Um, the semantics. What models of type theory can you model these in? So we have some nice theorems about this so far. If you've got some decently well-behaved, um, locally presentable quill and model categories, you can model these in those um, by unwinding the definition into an iterative construction. The computational behavior, tying into what Dan was saying last week, one wants one's type theory to implement well and have good proof theoretical properties. Can we preserve those properties with higher inductive types? That's still wide open. We really haven't worked out how to do that at all so far. So that's very open. And then internal development. How much homotopy can we do in the type theory using higher inductive types and univalence together? Well, so far what we've done seems to have worked fine, and we're doing more. So this is just um, very open-ended, but everything so far has seemed to work quite nicely with them. I think, yep. Thank you.